Good evening. Hello. Welcome to SOAS. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this very special SOAS centenary lecture. And a warm welcome to everyone actually across the world also because tonight, uh, tonight this event is being live streamed. So there are far more people joining us than, uh, than you can even see to your right and to your left. I am Leslie Benjamori. I'm director of the Center on Conflict, Rights and Justice here at SOAS in the politics department. And it is really, and, I, and I, I sincerely mean this, it's a true honor for me to be welcoming the renowned human rights lawyer, Hina Jelani, for this special centenary lecture. Um, it, it, I really can't say that enough. The series that this is part of uh, features lectures by high profile guests speaking on subjects that are very close to the SOAS mission, and I suspect very close to the hearts and to the work of many of you here this evening. We have welcomed many speakers, um, such as Woli Soyinka, Forrest Whitaker, Claudia Roden, and last week, Raja Shahade, who spoke at the school. Hina Jelani is very special to SOAS. She has come here many times. She is a lawyer practicing in the Supreme Court of Pakistan. She is also the director of AGHS Legal Aid Cell, a legal aid and human rights NGO in Pakistan. She established Pakistan's first all-women's law firm in 1980. The cases that she has conducted there have on numerous occasions become landmarks for setting human rights standards in Pakistan. She also founded Pakistan's National Human Rights Commission. She was one of its founding members and its first legal aid center. Her special areas of concern in her work have considered, have concerned the rights of women, minorities, children's, children and prisoners, including political prisoners. And her activity in these areas include legal aid, advocacy for rights, proposing and preparing legislative drafts for law reform, designing and conducting projects for the protection, promotion, and implementation of human rights of disadvantaged groups and their social, economic, and political development. From 2000 to 2008, she served as the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Human Rights Defenders. In 2004, she became a member of the UN Security Council established International Commission of Inquiry on Darfur. And in 2009, she was appointed as a member of the UN Fact-Finding Commission on Gaza. From 2012 to 2015, she was a member of the Global Civil Society Advisory Group to, to UN Women. So it's, it's clear the expertise that she brings, not only to the world of human rights, but also to us at SOAS is something that we value a tremendous amount. Tonight, Hina will be in conversation with our director of SOAS, Baroness Valerie Amos. Baroness Amos, as we all know, joined us as director of SOAS in September 2015. And previous to this, she served in the United Nations as the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator at the United Nations. Tonight's conversation promises to offer us insights across many subjects from Hina's legal career, the role of women in the practice of law, political activism, and her experience working in the United Nations. I mentioned earlier that our centenary lecture series has been key to providing a space to debate issues that are very close to the SOAS mission. And this is why we've also, in our centenary year, launched the Questions Worth Asking campaign. Um, so our students and academics can keep on asking very important questions. For example, uh, we ask as part of this campaign, is there a solution to the world's refugee crisis? Very easy questions, uh, very, <laughs> not very easy questions. What happens after war? Should we all speak the same language? What makes a global citizen? And it's true to say, I think, for those of us who have been at SOAS for a short time or a very long time, or maybe even only to visit and come to a public lecture, that it's clear that we have been asking searching questions here at SOAS. And through this campaign, what we're seeking to do is to develop support for these questions and for the institution, but especially for scholarships and student experience initiatives 
for academic projects and for endowed posts. And so I would encourage you to take a look. You can go onto the website. It's soas.ac.uk backslash questions. Please have a look. And please, for tonight's event, if you can make sure that your phones are on silent, but we, we do very much encourage you uh, to tweet, and if you would use the hashtag SOAS100 to, uh, to indicate our SOAS centenary, and if you would join me in welcoming now Hina Jelani and Valerie Amos, um, and enjoy this evening's lecture. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, thank you uh, so much, and uh, Hina, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you uh, it's, it's uh, to It's lovely SOAS. to be here. Thank you. Um, and I know that you have been with us uh, many, many times, but I think we're at that place and time uh, in the world when we really feel that it's important to revisit um, all of these issues around uh, human rights. And mm -hmm. uh, you've had the most... Uh, tremendous experience. Um, your CV, um, which was uh, just outlined, speaks for itself. But I know that one of the things you care absolutely passionately about is the role of human rights uh, defenders. And uh, you've had many, many firsts, but I know that you're particularly proud that you were the first UN special representative for human rights uh, defenders, something that you did for uh, eight years. And in an interview, um, you said, and I quote, uh, about human rights defenders, they contribute to poverty alleviation, humanitarian assistance, post-conflict reconstruction, and to improving individual indicators of development, such as access to healthcare and adult literacy, among many other activities. Why do you think that human rights defenders are so very important? Look, I think the world now has spent decades to create human rights standards and to create also bodies globally that deal with the promotion and protection of human rights. But most people forget that human rights cannot be visible and cannot be implemented and protected if there are not those who are willing to um, put themselves at risk in very, very difficult circumstances and promote human rights and undertake activities for the promotion and protection of human rights. The world over, it is these people who are largely at risk and that risk can never be mitigated unless and until the right to defend human rights is recognized as implied in all human rights instruments. This right to defend human rights is an independent right in itself. And it is the, the, the legal obligation under all international human rights instruments. Not just a right, but also an obligation. Not just for the state, but also for civil society actors to defend human rights. So in any action against them that, um, that um, uh, obstructs in any manner their activities, is a very serious violation of human rights. But at the same time, it's not just a violation of human rights. See, these are human, these are human beings. These are people who are working in very difficult circumstances. Human rights defenders today, just for the uh, uh, action to promote and protect human rights, are being killed, are being uh, disappeared, um, put under arbitrary detention, their uh, work is being vilified many times if they are, uh, their, their freedom of association is, is being curbed. And I think if today there is still a commitment towards human rights, you can imagine how valuable their work is. It is because of these defenders that we still recognize human rights as a universal value. Well, I'll come back in a moment to this idea of human rights as a un universal value and where we are uh, uh, today, because I think many of us are very worried about uh, the state of uh, human rights around the world. But what do you think continues to motivate human rights defenders who face these significant challenges uh, in carrying out that role? 
You know, I think first of all, we must understand that these are ordinary people facing extraordinary circumstances. I think generally, in my opinion, the kind of interaction I've had with people who do the kind of work that I do, myself, I'm also a human rights defender. I think it's just, number one, there is, they retain the, the uh, capacity to be outraged when they see injustice, they see discrimination, and they see violence. Um, we can't turn our face away. And I think that's the, that's the main uh, reason why people indulge in very risky work, because they do feel that there's no option. And I think that's, that's uh, what I find everywhere in the world. Wherever I've seen uh, human rights defenders who are at risk and have been in, in, in touch with them, this is the first characteristic that you identify in those people. They had the option, but they didn't want to take that option. And when, for example, um, you're based in Lahore, uh, you see what is happening, for example, here in the United Kingdom, where we had a commission looking at uh, the idea of a Bill of Rights uh, for the UK. Uh, we've had a long campaign against our Human Rights Act uh, and uh, actually getting rid of our Human Rights Act. There you are sitting in you know, the middle of uh, Pakistan uh, with other human rights uh, defenders and you look at what is happening in uh, Britain. What is your advice to us uh, about the extent to which we c have gone out to raise awareness about why our Human Rights Act uh, is important and in the way that we seek to defend it. Look, I come from a country where the Constitution very clearly spells out fundamental freedoms and human rights, uh, especially the right to uh, human dignity. Um, but not much is done in that context because we don't have organic law to support what the Constitution says. In Britain, yes, you have an organic law. I don't see the reason why this law should be uh, uh, in any way denigrated or its value should be denigrated. If anything, I think you need to improve it and make it stronger. Um, I was just speaking to you just before we entered this room and um, told you about this International Commission of Jurist um, mission that we did, fact-finding, on several countries uh, around the world on how counterterrorism is compliant with human rights norms and with, with the laws in the different countries. And we found that the comparison between Australia and the UK was certainly in favor of the UK because there were many restraining factors in the, in, the, in, the, in the Human Rights Act which did not bound the Australian uh, state in, in, in any way and they could commit human rights violations um, in counterterrorism uh, with, with no accountability and almost impunity because there was no legal barrier. Here there is a legal barrier to act in accordance with law and with just and fair procedures. So do you think we're complacent? That Sorry? We do you think we have become complacent? I think, uh, I think the, what I see the world over is, um, is, is complacency on the one hand um, and a failure in promoting the values of human rights and preventing um, uh, other tendencies to, to in many ways, uh, denigrate those values. Um, discrimination is on the rise. Uh, what we thought would never be a part of anybody's public uh, position, now people claim uh, uh, you know, electoral successes on the basis of such uh, claims and such positions. So I do believe that this is the time that human rights values are declining. And let me also say that they will not decline to the, to the uh, uh, um, um, disadvantage of the elite. It will always be the poor, the marginalized, and the more vulnerable people who will suffer if human rights as values are not, uh, do not remain as the, as the standard to which everybody must rise, whether it is on the, on the social level or on the level of the state. 
I think this is going to hurt people who are more vulnerable. I wanted to take you back, if, if I may. Um, you come from a very activist uh, family. Uh, your father was imprisoned several times for challenging uh, the military and religious authorities in uh, Pakistan. You yourself have been uh, arrested. You've received uh, death threats. Uh, your family uh, have been uh, threatened. What's given you the strength uh, to carry on? I don't think it's strength, really, but um, it's more like resilience, let us say. Um, I, I, like everybody else, I think there's no option. Um, how would I I'm benefit? I'm not sure that everybody else thinks that there's no option. Well, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a conscious decision that you've made, and it's, it's a difficult decision that you have made, because you, you were, you know, on many occasions when you faced those threats, uh, one of the options open to you was to leave Pakistan, and you didn't leave. You stayed. I can't leave Pakistan because I, that's my home. And uh, my, uh, my instinct is that if that's the place I want to live in, I want to make it easy for myself as well as for others. If that happens for others, that's fine. But it's for myself too that I work. Uh, I'm a woman. And for that matter, I think working, you know, uh, uh, trying to survive in a very male-dominated society, in a society that resists um, 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 non discriminate values of non discrimination, values of tolerance. I think in that kind of society, if you are a woman, if you are a person that believes in fairness and justice, I have many, many people in Pakistan who, who do the kind of work that I do. And it is in that uh, group and that society of human rights defenders that I think it would, I, I find it easier to overcome any fear. I, I'm not stupid. I know that when these threats come, they mean something. And I'm very careful, of course. But this is work that has to be done. And I hope that, you know, uh, uh, this resilience produces results, ultimately, and it has. In, even in a country like Pakistan, we have made progress although we would like it to be much more, but it is still not static or stagnant. So it's these small successes that give you the energy and the will to, to go forward. I mean, uh, everybody will tell you that we'd rather do work for human rights and be safe. But at the same time, if we don't have that kind of environment, the option is not to stop, because that won't change anything. And growing up and seeing your father um, arrested, uh, I mean, what kind of impact do you think that that had on you? I think the first impact that it has had on me and which has been of great value to me is that my fear of prison went away. So it was even, so common. Even, even a fear of prison in Pakistan went away? Yes, a fear right. of prison went away. And when I was ar arrested once and taken, actually taken to prison, uh, believe me, I was not as frightened as my other colleagues were who were also taken to prison at the same time. Because for me, this was a place where I would go and see my father. And um, sometimes it was like a picnic, because you could see him only very infrequently. So I mean, that way, I think it has helped. It's not something extraordinary. It's not something that overwhelms you. It's not pleasant, certainly. But I can, t I mean, just to share with you, uh, although I usually don't, I am perhaps the only person in the world who gained weight in prison. <laughs> uh, well, I have to say, I'm, 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 I'm still trying to deal with that image of prison as a picnic and gaining weight in prison. Th those two phrases are going to stay with me for a very long time. Um, now, what I'm going to do, uh, I have a whole series of questions, but uh, I know that uh, you in the audience will all also have questions. So I just want to bring in a couple of people before I continue with uh, some of my questions. Uh, anyone have a question? Uh, please. Uh, there should be a mic somewhere. Hello? Mic? Is... No, that is not a mic. Do you mind standing up and... 
Yeah. The mic's coming. Down here, please. Thank you. We need two, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Aha, there's one there. Uh, okay. My name is Aisha Sidi Khan, and uh, I'm from Pakistan. And I was practicing law in Islamabad before coming here for my master's. And I started off as a human rights lawyer. So, uh, I mean, we would do strategic litigation on issues like drone strikes, enforced disappearances, death penalty. And I was very passionate about these issues. And, uh, but I felt that, you know, we can set those ripples, but we don't really see those results out there. Maybe it takes decades, but it's kind of frustrating. You really want to do something, but you don't see things happening. So can you, from your experience, tell me that any concrete things which have happened in Pakistan as a result of human rights litigation and activism? Thank you. You, you know, in my life as a lawyer, there have been several frustrating uh, events, but I do see things. And I think if, if you are a human rights defender, you should always try and be on the lookout to see what, what has happened and what you have achieved. Uh, there is never a failure. I'll, I'll give you one example. When the women's movement was launched against discriminatory laws uh, uh, in, in the 1980s, and women uh, you know, came out in a very activist and, uh, manner to, to, to resist the impact of these laws and to challenge the authority of the military regime that was doing all this. We were standing on the streets, holding our placards and saying, you know, down with these discriminatory laws. Some people from my family say even to me today that, you know, you were standing there with this placard for 20 years, down with these laws, and the only thing you've achieved so far and you've gained, only thing you've gained so far is weight. But that's not true. For one thing, I think they fail to appreciate the fact that I was still there standing there. And I mean, by I, I mean all the women who were a part of the movement. Secondly, please tell me, you're too young to remember this, but the 80s decade was one of the worst in the life of Pakistan, and especially for women, minorities, and other marginalized communities. In 1988, Pakistan elected its first woman prime minister. Every political party in the 1988 elections had a women's program in their manifesto, even jamaat e islami What else do you want? The recognition that women are there and that non-discrimination is a value and that the women's issues have become so political what else did you want us to achieve in eight years? So it's never a failure. It is true that when we have gone one step further, there, be, there have been two steps backwards. But remember that this one step further that you took gave you the energy and the will to go on with the struggle. And we still go on. You remember this whole scenario uh, about uh, honor killings in Pakistan. Honor killings is a practice that is happening in many parts of the world and not just amongst Muslim societies. Pakistan's women waged a war against honor killings. There was a time when after an incident, actually it happened in my office when a woman was killed by her family, we went to the Senate uh, with a resolution asking the senators to pass that resolution against honor killings. One of the senators who supported us placed that resolution there and he was almost lynched in the Senate on the basis that this is a part of our culture and how dare anyone challenge it. Today, you will not find anybody, whether a politician, an academic, a religious uh, leader, anybody who can publicly say that or defend on a killing. They may not have changed their mindset, but publicly, it's not something that is in any way uh, correct for anybody to say politically. So I think these are some things that you need to look for. There has never been a total failure. The fact, you see, we are not the state. 
we can't really do much in terms of changing legislation. But our voices must, in some ways, become part of the narrative, become a part of the public discussions, so that at least the issues become visible and, in some ways, become a part of what people generally talk about. So women's issues, issues about minorities in Pakistan. You know, the day before yesterday was holy, and it is for the first time that Pakistan's prime minister celebrated holy with the Hindu community in Pakistan. <coughs> this is just a gesture to give a message to those who were harassing minorities in Pakistan, killing them, driving them away. Pakistan's minority population, you know, over the years has declined, unfortunately, because non-Muslim citizens have decided to leave that country. And I'm glad that even though it's late in the day, at least the, the, the uh, political element in our country has started to realize that this is not in the interest of the country itself, which, has, which is the, the major force that has driven a prime minister in that country to celebrate Holi, a Hindu festival, with that community. So I think these are some of the things that we must, as human rights defenders, keep looking for and drawing courage for, from such successes, that things do change. Change will not come overnight anywhere in the world. So one, one case in a court and one good judgment from, from a particular court, and I'm talking to you as a lawyer, will not change things overnight. But then there will be a time when the most prejudiced judges will find it difficult to, for instance, denigrate women publicly in a court of law by calling them, you know, these uh, frustrating divorces, divorces or frustrated divorces. These are words that we've got in judgments. And, and things like women are the, are the uh, evildoers and they are the temptresses. Now nobody talks about it. So 20 years ago, it was quite uh, frustrating to hear these. But, but these are things that do change. And I think I have confidence in the value of human rights and dignity of people and non-discrimination. And it's my confidence that counts, really. If I have confidence in changing things, I will go on. Whether there is a society that resists it, I don't care. This is something that I think we have to make them understand. Can I, I'm going to bring you in, in, in just a moment, but I, I wanted to just pick up on this point in relation to uh, uh, women and uh, human rights, because you have been out there as a strong advocate, really challenging uh, on these issues. Um, and you talk about the fact that at a policy-making level, um, at a political level, uh, no one is going to use these kinds of terms anymore. But at the same time, you need to wear the, raise the awareness of women of those rights. Uh, what kind of work has been done and what do you see as some of the successes in relation to women themselves actually becoming, uh, having a greater understanding of their rights and then moving on to campaign for them? I think initially um, we made a strategic mistake by talking only to women. So what I see today is very well aware young women in Pakistan. But because we were not targeting the society, the sensitivity and awareness of the society is not at the same level. So we have women now more willing and, and, and um, um, you know, in some ways passionate about um, asserting their rights. The society is resisting, so there's friction. And this I have uh, seen also a, in terms of the, kind, uh, the, the, the number of women who now leave the home and seek protection in shelters that one of them I run uh, in Lahore. So there is that friction. Women are aware now. They are asserting their rights. We have to target the society so that the communities and the society itself doesn't resist. And the best way of doing that, I think, is, you know, it's awareness is fine. Mm. But when there is a society that's so resistant, there has to be more authoritative means 
to, uh, to uh, bring about change. And that can be done only through the law. So even though law is not just the only thing that can bring about change, it is the first stepping stone and a tool in the hands of human rights defenders. Because if there is no law and there is no legal right which we can enforce, what do you do? Yeah. I mean, I'm a lawyer and I give advice to women all the time in family law, which some years ago was very weak in Pakistan. I can't tell her, you know, sister, wait till we bring about change in people's mindsets. I have to find a way of helping her. So whatever you do, even we made bad laws work for us because we had no option. But that's the only authoritative tool that we can make work. So I think it's important that awareness is proportionate to also the authoritative means that you may have for allowing people the access to justice and also real effective remedies. Thank you. The, the gentleman here who's been waiting. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Speaker and Baroness, I really appreciate your holding a uh, moot, you know, on this subject. But my humble submission is this, that how human rights can be inseparable from the social and economic system which is prevalent in a country. For example, you being a lawyer, the Article 3 of Pakistan Constitution 1973 absolutely in unambiguous terms and unequivocally declares and proclaims that an elimination of all kinds of exploitation and if the wording of that amendment or the article which is three that from each according to his ability to each according to his work may i ask you to article, come to the question i i would like to just ask you, what has been done collectively with all the force and the activism of human rights, activists and leaders, real ones and fake ones, to get that article implemented? And Thank you. What are the impediments in its way? Military, mullah, or feudalism? Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you've asked that question. This particular article is one of the least used article in our courts of law under constitutional jurisdiction of the, of the courts, including that of the Supreme Court. However, you will notice that there, are, there is now a trend building, uh, especially under the human rights jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of Pakistan, where this article has been referred to. I wish much, it, it is used much more than it is being now at this, at this point. But I agree with you that it's a very valuable article, gives extremely uh, broad um, um, range of, of rights uh, under this particular article. It has not been done as well as we should have done. Uh, to use this article, and I hope that more and more people will use it. One of the problems with our constitution, if you notice, is that while there are civil and political rights that are protected and guaranteed under the chapter on fundamental rights, the social, economic, and, and uh, cultural rights are enshrined in a, in, in, a, in a chapter called the principles of policy. And those are enforceable those are obligatory on the state only if the state has the resources to do it. In our country, uh, state always hides behind lack of resources to fulfill its obligations under economic, social, and cultural rights. What we say as human rights defenders the world over is that resources, availability of resources is not the problem. The problem is allocation of resources. And in many countries of the world, 
fast pace of militarization of the state is given more priority than finding the right kind of security for the people of that state. Now, we talk about the, the um, uh, Security Council, which um, many years ago passed a resolution 1325, talking about women's participation in peace build, building and women's participation in, 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 um, in dealing with, with the aftermath or uh, uh, consequences of, of conflict. Unfortunately, the way that society uh, ascribes roles to women and the way that women still see themselves, women have largely restricted their peace and security activities to taking care of IDPs and refugees and have become more and more a part of that particular process of serving uh, 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 populations at risk because of conflict. Now, that's fine, but it's not an empowering process. Look, feeling good is very different from feeling empowered. It's very good. I feel very good when I do work on IDPs or refugees. But what, I, what empowers me would be if I had a voice in constructing the security paradigm and constructing the security narrative. I want to be a part of national bodies that talk about security. I want to be a voice there. I want to have my voice heard. Why should I? Uh, uh, start think, why should I think that it is my, my role only to deal with the mess that somebody else creates? My job should be, or my status should be, to be able to create that narrative. What, what for me as a woman means, what does security mean to me? So I think these are some of the things that we need uh, to think about in terms of the role of the citizen and the role of women as citizens. Not just nationally, but also to create that narrative at the global level. I was at the Munich, uh, Munich Security Council, uh, con Conference last uh, month, and I was astounded and really horrified to hear almost every world leader speaking at that conference about raising defense expenditure, as opposed to looking after the population's uh, needs in their own countries, but also the dire necessity of dealing with this mass movement of people that we are uh, experiencing right now. They have securitized the whole refugee issue. So all you hear is what kind of a security threat refugees can be. And little is, uh, 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 little attention is given to the fact that under international law, these are people who are not illegal. I'm talking about refugees. They have certain protections and they have certain rights both over the host country and the country of origin. And these, this mass movement of people has to have some resolution. We have to undertake innovative ways and consistently look for ways of ending conflict, uh, ending bad governance, ending people's need for employment and economic, uh, um, for, uh, as far as the migrants are con uh, concerned, there is every person in the world has the right to work. This is part of their human right. And both the host countries and the countries of origin are uh, culpable. If an environment and a climate has been made globally, which is driving people out of their homes and forcing them. Now, I keep hearing this refugee crisis. Ref well, the crisis is that of the refugee. The challenge is for the world. 
But it's not a crisis for the world or, the glo or, or, or globally. The crisis is of that poor community and the poor population that's now had to leave their home and is now being, being vilified, looked at with suspicion. And all humanitarian responsibility is put aside. So I think these are some of the things that we have to look at from the point of view of the people who suffer. And when we were speaking about human rights values now being, being uh, uh, something that people are stepping back from, it is these people who will suffer. If there is no prevention and preservation of, 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 this, uh, the, of the human rights value, if you fail to preserve it now, the opportunity will be lost. And then we have to work what we did for 50 years, we'll be behind. So let me take you to another part of that security agenda and that uh, universal values agenda, which is around torture. Uh, you were recently elected president of the World Organization Against uh, Torture. Congratulations. Um, but many of us have been very worried about uh, the noises that were coming out of the United States uh, during uh, the campaign for the presidency and uh, since that uh, torture may be returning to the counterterrorism uh, toolbox. Um, you talked, um, uh, I think, in the interview immediately um, after you were elected uh, president about the need to uh, convince people, not just condemn their point of view in relation to, to torture. Um, I think many of us uh, are worried that in the world that we're in, uh, that uh, convincing uh, in a world where, you know, facts and evidence um, is not necessarily taken uh, seriously, that we are on a very slippery slope. Um, what is your advice about what can be done uh, to, to basically combat this movement uh, towards the use of to torture in these circumstances. You know, that particular um, um, sentence was in the context of convincing people uh, generally who are supporting action of the state that amounts to torture. There is no way that we need to convince states. Their obligations are already very clearly defined. Torture is a right that can never be violated under any circumstances. There is no um, uh, justification for tor torture at all under the law. You can't bring out any circumstance to say, because of this, we uh, uh, are now um, justifying to torture. But what worries me, and why I speak about convincing, is that a large number of population in many countries has lost the power to analyze, and are now blindly uh, uh, influenced by the, the state rhetoric and the fear that is being spread uh, in the name of rising crime, in the name of terrorism, and are going along with this notion that torture can ever, ever be justified or has any value in counterterrorism or or uh, controlling crime. So that's why I said we need to now spread awareness also amongst the population so that they are convinced and they are not mis uh, misled into this belief that torture helps. So uh, 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 that's one thing. What is perhaps a little bit of hope that I see, glimmer of hope is that the United States tried its best many years ago under the Bush regime to justify some forms of torture and didn't succeed. I was recently in the United States and this was a fear that many of us were discussing from the human rights community. And I'm happy to note that somebody who was um, a part of the, of the uh, administration some time ago said that that may not be a fear that comes about and because there is resistance from within the administration which means that we can still hope that um, this kind of uh, condoning of torture 
will not in reality takes pla take place. This is something that, especially coming from societies where the state has indulged in torture as a policy, we understand that this is not going to take us anywhere. It will not rid us of terrorism. It will not rid us of, of crime. Um, as a lawyer, I know, um, I'm, I'm also, I'm a criminal lawyer, so I know very well that confessions under torture are the favorite method of governments because it is their convenience that they're looking at. But that has, in many ways, fouled the whole justice system. Because torture, in many times, produces confessions that are not real. They are only being made because they want to avoid torture. So many innocent people get punished because of these fake confessions. We also know that torture has never produced evidence either that will stand the test in a court of law or will indicate the right direction for investigation. And we've had so many of these cases that it's now almost a scientific proof for us and not anecdotal any, anymore. Thank you. I'll take another uh, question. Um, the lady up here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, talking of the US. Uh, in the past couple of years, I've noticed there's quite a large degree of complacency that goes towards issues of discrimination um, within the United States because people take the opinion of, oh, you know, racism is not half as bad anymore statutorily because we are no, no longer in Jim Crow South. Um, what ways have you seen in terms of dealing with that issue and dealing with complacency or opinions about discrimination no longer being as bad, therefore we don't have to deal with it? I don't think it's really complacency which is allowing a national narrative to be built which defies all norms of human rights. I don't think it's complacency. I think it is anger, anger at something else and you take it out on another. I think it's largely that's what's happening. People say, oh, there is frustration with the establishment. Well, if there is frustration with the establishment, what have you got against uh, uh, the others who are either not of, your same, of the same color or of the same religion that you want to denigrate their rights? So I, I, I really think it's not complacency. It's something that is very different. And it's something that needs to be curbed. It's not a tendency that, come, that is coming out of some, some natural instinct. It's unnatural instinct that is allowing people to think in a manner in which they are violating the rights of others and violating the most sacred of rights, which is that of human dignity. And OK, I've got a hand down here that's been here for a long time, but I'm, I'm going to come down to you in one second. I'm just going to take one more up there. Hi, um, thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, so I come from Australia, so a system, a government where, um, you know, we tend to protect um, a system that's very, very flawed and protects well, doesn't protect people in offshore detention systems. I was wondering what you thought um, individual people can do in terms of protecting and promoting human rights. I think first what they need to do is believe in the values of human rights themselves. Um, from the region from where I come, many times in the past, we have seen leaders using what they call Asian values to in some ways separate us from the universal values and saying, uh, you know, we are Asian people and we have our own values. Well, let me say, in the first place, this kind of uh, position has always been taken to cover up the vile and abuse of human rights that such leaders have committed. And they were known for human rights abuse. When they speak about Asian values, let me also tell you, there is not a single principle of human rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
in the two covenants on human rights or any other international human rights instrument that I don't cherish as a Pakistani coming from the South Asian region, which has been largely and for many years under, been under colonial rule. Who knows the value of, of freedom more than we people do? And I respect and recognize the struggle of my forefathers. To say that these are Western values is an insult to those people in my region who have fought for freedom, who have fought for uh, uh, um, 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 uh, disc uh, fought against discrimination, fought for states that are better governed, justice and fairness. I think it is it is an insult to them to call this Western values. The the Universal Declaration may have been signed in New York. The point is, everything in that declaration refers to situations that we have confronted and we have fought to lift and remedy. Can I, I'm going to bring you in in a moment, sir, but I, I, it's this issue of Western values that I want to pick up on, because I know that you're on the advisory board of the, to the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, and of course the ICC very often has been accused of promoting uh, Western values, Western law, European uh, law. We've had uh, South Africa and Burundi, uh, for example, uh, Russia, uh, the Gambia, although with the change of government that might change, uh, withdrawing from the ICC. What is your answer to that? You know, I think instead of withdrawing from the ICC, these uh, leaders should have taken a very strong stand to improve the ICC. Uh, I think that the ICC and the concept of international criminal justice is absolutely necessary. It is also justified. The statute of the ICC may have some weaknesses. We need, however, to lift those weaknesses. I don't see uh, the role of the Security Council as being very strong in making sure that international justice is, uh, is, um, is, is um, you know, widely served um, and that the, the um, procedures um, apply um, to everyone in the world. I, however, do not subscribe to the view that only Africans are being targeted. I think that if we look at the um, um, Yugoslavian um, tribunal, much has been done there. Um, I, would, I wish that more can be done, and I wish that the ICC is made stronger. If people, if countries start um, opting out, it will become even weaker. So if you feel that international justice must be done. Many of these African leaders who have been uh, brought to, uh, before the court, actually it's their own people, it's their own governments who have referred them to the court. So they can't claim discrimination in any way. It is all our wish that nobody escapes. And let's bring the ICC to that condition where nobody will escape. But I don't think it's a, white or European conspiracy to limit the accusation of international crime to one continent or one region. Thank you. Finally, it's your turn. <laughs> I'm sorry it's taken so long. Um, my name is uh, Jim Curran from the Irish Civil Rights Association. I have a brief uh, question. Uh, the United Kingdom now has the European Human Rights Act operating and a number of politicians and lawyers want to replace it with a British Human Rights Act. Uh, we Irish have experienced discrimination in human rights and civil rights uh, from London administrations since 1169. And for, finally, we have long memories. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. 
and a long record. Uh, we also have a long memory, but we also have a long record. Uh, we're a very small nation, and we have a long record of campaigning for human rights and civil rights. Uh, and we are concerned not alone about our own country, but also about other uh, countries around the world, wherever they may be. Uh, my fa the, the question I have is uh, the, human, uh, the European Human Rights Act uh, we in the free part of Ireland are going to retain it. But if a British Bill of Rights uh, was brought in, it would affect the people in the occupied part of Ireland. So my question is, uh, should we in the United Kingdom uh, abandon the European Human Rights Act, or should we strongly support it, or should we go for a British, a British uh, Bill of Rights? I, I really can't answer that question. I don't know enough about it to give you any advice. My instinct says that um, there has to be organic law to back up the, the, the access to, to human rights and to produce effective remedies for the implementation of human rights that any um, uh, legal document con contains. We've been fighting for a long time uh, to bring the principles of our constitution within the realm of domestic law, so that there is organic law really to back up what the constitution says, and uh, with less uh, uh, potential for adverse interpretations for the convenience of the state. So these are some of the things I think that many of us go through in many ways, um, I can't advise you, but I hope that uh, whatever is best in order to safeguard and protect fundamental freedoms and human rights of the population uh, uh, concerned is adopted. We are over time, and I, uh, I'm going to use chair's privilege, I'm afraid, because I've got two questions I really, really want to ask. Um, so I'm going to ask them um, and hope that they're not uh, too tricky. The first is... Um, that you've been a very outspoken, uh, outspoken critic, obviously, of military rule in uh, Pakistan, but also some aspects of uh, Islamic law in Pakistan. And you said in an interview, and I quote, um, and I've sort of uh, um, altered the quote slightly to, to make sense because I've taken it you know, from a longer quote. If a national policy is founded on religion, Sectarian and denominational differences within religions will be manifested in political tensions as well as oppressive uh, restraints uh, on dissent. Can you say some more about um, what you mean, why that is so problematic, and give some examples from your experience? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the, Pakistan is a living example of what I've said uh, in those few words. Um, I, I respect people's right and freedom to, of religion. I respect people who want to uh, uh, construct their uh, and conduct their uh, way of life in accordance with their beliefs. But I don't think that there is in any religion or any culture a justification for anyone to impose any kind of belief on others. That is one thing. In my country, and I'll give you that example again, although it's happening in many other countries, because that's the, 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 the uh, circumstances that I know best. Religion has been used, or rather misused, as a weapon of fear to create fear, to, to silence political uh, uh, dissent. Anything that you say against a religious political element in that country is suddenly turned into blasphemy. It is not any kind of denigration of any holy personality or any religion that uh, 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 gives rise to accusation of blasphemy. If you talk against a scholar, that is spewing out extremism, that is spewing out intolerance and hatred. Today in Pakistan, even that is blasphemy. And people are using social media to create that kind of hatred. They are pressurizing the state 
to target these people. The result was, very recently, five bloggers were disappeared by our intelligence agencies out of pressure from the uh, religious lobby. Look, it doesn't, the point is that we should all feel good about our religion if we are believers. Don't make us feel bad about our religion. And don't make us think about the negative about our religion. All religion, all religions in the world, if people believe in them, should be to take us towards better human, human conduct more respect for others, more hum humanity rather than losing our humanity. So in the light of that, how optimistic are you for the future of Pakistan? I'm never pessimistic. Like, uh, like B Archbishop Desmond Tutu uh, has said, we are all prisoners of hope. And that's one prison I don't want to leave. <laughs> Hina Jalani, thank you so much.